Okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I got to it first. I got to it first. I got to it. <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, I'm Waco. I'm the founder of Revolution Magazine and also another magazine called The Rake, which is about men's style. You know, listen, I guess when we, we launched Revolution, um, I guess it's uh, almost 13 years ago now. It was actually in some ways controversial, right? The whole idea, and it's also incidentally not necessarily something I would repeat today, because in the context of today, I don't think it's it's quite as cool as it was then, but you had to make a provocation, right? Um, so the whole idea was that there was an insularity related to watch collecting, related to the sort of insular, hobbyist, um, kind of overly cerebral, very Germanic sort of per perception of watch collecting. Basically, you know, it was meant to be a little bit boring, and for guys that were, I don't know, listening to Dusty harp music and, and, I don't know, polishing the, the emblems on their Rolls Royces or, or what have you. And, and we wanted to make it cool, right? So one of the ways we did, and, and to make it cool, we had to, to, to connect watches with every context and, uh, of, of, so, of contemporary culture. You know, we had to, to make it related to music, to art, to film, and, and to everything that was sexy and beautiful, right? So we, we initially um, put like a really hot um, woman wearing a super complicated watch along a double split on our first cover. Now, that was super controversial, but it made people pay attention to it. Now, the way we got, we brought it back from being just a purely sort of gimmicky kind of thing was that um, it was, from a technical perspective, very well written. Right, it was you were getting information that from a technical perspective that you couldn't get from other magazines, or even if you could get it from again one of these dry dramatic magazines, it wasn't told to you in a fun way. I mean, a split second chronograph and a double split second chronograph is not a particularly exciting subject matter for most people. So the whole idea is how do you make it relevant to everyone, and you had to do it in terms of the color, the language, but you had to make sure that technically you had your your, your facts straight because it would if you didn't you would have fall on your face. You'd be a magazine that was about style and not substance, and you had. To to have both. My magazine, Revolution, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Mike. Um, not because he you know, was a big supporter, but he was. But the point was, like my concepts in terms of what I wanted to cover were really formalized because of um, something that Mike did in 2004 called Tempest. So there's a perception that Singapore is this extraordinary um, watch market because of the Singaporean watch consumer. And that's true to some extent, but people oftentimes forget that it's also the retailers, and I would say in particular the Hourglass, and in particular Mike, that created a watch culture in Singapore that did not exist and does not exist really anywhere else in the world. And the things that he was doing really would fall within the category of an editorial sort of enterprise, right? I mean, the idea that he's taking you know these amazing independent watchmakers or he's taking one of the you know biggest um, CEOs in the world with one of the sort of most sort of irascible and crazy independent dudes and talking to them both from their perspectives of design or taking talking to them from the perspectives of, of, of um, whether they should be forward thinking or, or looking towards their past for inspiration or what have you um, he had created a platform for watch knowledge and the sharing of watch knowledge that was at the highest level of anything I'd ever seen before at, at, at Tempest. And so I, when I was thinking about revolution, I was like, you know, I can see that, that, that people are really receptive to the highest and most ambitious level of watch storytelling of watch narrative. And so we shouldn't try to dumb it down, we should try to reach for the highest level that we can. Tempest was a demonstration to me that there was this, this hunger and desire for sophisticated watch storytelling uh, at, in a way that had never been done before. And so I guess part of being revolutionary, if you will, was to, to bring that to a, the next level, you know? It was incredible for me to meet um, Mr. Beaver, who I just had an interview with, or Max Busser, or Felix Baumgartner, or Philippe Dufour, or, or any of these incredible people in the watch industry, and they were all there to just share their passion, thanks to the Hourglass and thanks to Mike. The first thing is that um, in the context of where we have all evolved today, you know, it was interesting, I was watching a movie when it first came out called Superbad, and I thought it was hilarious, right? You know, and then I, I tried to watch it you know, like about a year ago, and I had to turn it off because it was so offensive, right? It, it was, um, and it just goes to show you that, uh, and hopefully as a culture, we're all a lot more enlightened by the by the things that have happened in the last half decade, and, and the way in which we interact, the way we have to treat people, you have to treat them with a lot more respect. So this whole objectification 
objectification of women and, and mechanical watches is totally uncool now, right? Um, it was interesting because once we did it and once we, it became commercially successful and the industry started to pay attention to it, and, and again, I, I don't think it's purely because of, of the sexiness of the magazine. I think it was also because we got our, you know, our storytelling and facts and technical stuff straight as well. Um, other people started to copy us, right? And it became, in some ways, a cliche after a while. So also, because it became so commonplace to put like a hot girl with a, a watch on the cover of a magazine, it became quite uninteresting to us, you know? Um, so the, the question is today, how would I do it differently? I don't know. Um, I, that's actually interesting you say that because now I'm trying to engineer the next phase of the development of revolution. And I don't know what the answer is necessarily. I don't know if, because the whole idea was always to take the watch and, and somehow make it um, broader than just an object on your wrist, right? So what has happened now is that everyone does these sort of lifestyle type shoots with people wearing watches. So if it's like, you know, let's say it's an uh, uh, aviation theme watch, someone wearing a flight helmet looking into space, or if it's a nautical watch, then someone wearing a captain's helmet and or looking you know, evocatively into space. But it's getting a bit boring, right? You know, you're now in a period where print is becoming increasingly irrelevant, right? It's, but then, there's a charming sort of analog quality to it. So like the world's most powerful um, e-commerce entity in the world, Netta Porter, what was the first thing they did after they became successful at e-commerce? They launched a print magazine. And why did they do that? Because it gave them this charming, old school analog reassurance, a second emotional touch point after their e-commerce business. And you today you need two or three or four emotional touch points that create a universe, right? So if I were gonna, going to create something today, like for example with my men's magazine, The Rake, um, in order for that magazine to sustain itself, to exist for the future, for me to have um, the vision I wanted for that magazine, I had to go into e-commerce because then that magazine is now given a certain independence as well. I can write about the things I want. I can feature the type of brands I want because I also can make money from selling those brands as well and not be um, purely linked to this very barbaric relationship between advertising and editorial, which will deracinate your vision, right? If all you do is spend time writing about brands that um, advertise with you, you're just going to end up with a soulless piece of shit, right? And, and, and that's the truth. So if you want to be better, you better figure it out and you gotta figure it out now. So to, the, to me, a print magazine today is a great emotional touch point, but it has to be an honest one, right? It can't just write marketing drivel in there because the consumer is too intelligent for this. You have to write about the things that you really believe in and you have to lead the way in terms of that. Then you need to have a great web presence as well and you have to have an amazing social presence as well. And actually, I would say the biggest innovation today is related to um, the potential for, um, well, as you guys are doing, uh, filmic storytelling through today's mediums. For example, Instagram story, I think, is an incredible medium, and I think that you, the capacity to tell stories in 10 seconds, right, um, to use that 10-second cut is almost like that that moment between part one of the story and part two of the story, I think that, that not enough people are capitalizing on this and I think that's the way forward. So I think that you need great social, you need great web, you need a great foundation with analog and print and then I think you need, um, uh, and I think you need e-commerce as well, which incidentally, I don't necessarily feel needs to be combative between the traditional retailer and the, these new um, phase of, of e-commerce development. I think certain e-commerce businesses have taken that perspective, but I feel as if what's missing is an e-commerce business that actually enhances the possibilities of the traditional retailer and maybe unites the best traditional retailers in the world through a single platform, which is communication driven. And if you look at like, whether it's Bulang and Sun or, um, uh, what Silas is thinking, a collected man, or analog shift, or any of these guys who are doing a good job in terms of the vintage businesses that they're doing, they are very communication facing, they're very editorial facing. Um, I think that there is an opportunity for the most powerful retailers in the world to also um, instantly sort of merge that into their, their, their organization. I mean, they need to, they need to have um, be on a social department, um, a full-time editorial department, and ideally, hopefully, people at a very high level. Um, or maybe the, the future is related to the merger between the best in editorial and the best in retail. Um, I, I, I don't know, a per, you know, because we're all experiencing this now as, as we move forward, but that's where I see it happening. I think that it's very hard to have um, retail today without also great communication and great editorial and great storytelling and incidentally it has to be truthful as well because everyone is too smart now to, to fall for sort of marketing messages. Um, 
And at the same time, it's very hard to be an editorial entity without having some retail offer as well. What we have offered so far is um, only two things. We've offered uh, vintage watches, primarily Omegas, because we have got a very good relationship with Omega, and I love the fact that they you can get an extract from the archive to authenticate the watches. You know, and then we've uh, offered um, our own limited edition watches. Where we haven't gone, which is where Hodinkee has gone, is to sell the same um, primary normal production product that you can find in the normal retailer because I don't want to create, foster that sense of competition. Um, I'm not sure, like I would have, I would be very receptive to selling that product with a retailer, right? Um, like whether that would be the best entity in the United States or the best entity in Southeast Asia. And I don't know, um, maybe the solution is to have, you know, sort of some regional, um, how shall I put it, uh, uh, boundaries in terms of that so that that, that can be um, logical to each of the people that are involved and then we then provide the communication platform for that. I don't have the 100% the solution as to what or, sh or a perfect understanding of what the future will be, but I do know that this convergence is happening and it's happening very rapidly. One thing that everyone forgets about is that the convergence is probably gonna happen even faster, not for the independent retailer and not for us as an independent um, uh, uh, editorial entity, but at the group level. Right, like I, I, if you look at, for example, what um, Richemont Group has done, they've bought, they have all the brands, they've bought now one of the biggest pre-owned businesses as well, right? They have Mr. Porter and Mrs. and Netta Porter, which are communication driven. If they were to add to that editorial expertise, the offer that they would be capable of of of, of achieving is quite extraordinary, you know. So I think that, and, and also if you look at, at the results of Richmond Group, right, their um, watch sector is relatively flat, except for Cartier, which has grown quite quite a lot, and you know, clearly Cyril, Cyril Vigneron, who's a friend of yours, is a very, very smart man. I love the fact that Cartier actually started to make Cartier watches as opposed to you know, trying to make complicated watches. Um, but the growth is happening from uh, e-commerce, right? It's happening from Netta Porter and Mr. Porter, and it's happening from WatchFinder. Now, what have they done? They basically, um, if you've since the, the ownership um, and then at some point joint venture with Ukes, they've taken, I can speak from the perspective of Mr. Porter, they've taken um, a company that was doing 60 million in terms of revenue and they've pushed it up to $200 million, right? But where are they gonna go from there? It, I mean, uh, clearly they wanna make it a one billion, or sorry, one million dollar, uh, yeah, one, one, one uh, um, billion dollar company. The only way they can achieve that is by by coming at it from a different angle than just purely organic growth, right? And they've already kind of given that answer because they are now going to be in partnership with Alibaba in China. And e-traditional e-commerce has not been able to tap into the mainland Chinese market because the platforms are not the same, right? China, China cleverly has made it such that e-commerce is only available to the Chinese through platforms that are indigenous to China, right? And Alibaba, I mean, you saw on, on what was it, Singles Day or Black Friday, what it was, they did a billion dollars in 90 seconds, right? I mean, it's crazy. I think they ended it with like, what, like 48 billion or something like that, something insane. So it goes to show you the potential of that specific market. The second thing is that, you know, whether we want to admit it or not, right, when we talk about watch buyers, the majority of them are Asian, right? Uh, it's whether it transacts in the United States, whether it transacts in Europe, whether it transacts in Singapore, whether it transacts in China or Australia, right? Like, I mean, uh, it, it's, they're, they're primary Asian. So we, as um, an epicenter for commerce, is we're a very significant epicenter. So if you kind of think about it from that perspective, okay, now they're gonna go start this joint venture with Alibaba, that's the way they're gonna make it a billion dollar company, right, or a billion dollar company. And every, I would say five to 10 years, there's a, a certain city in the world that becomes the most seminal city, right? So for example, at the end of the Second World War, New York in the 50s became the, the most important city in the world. Why? Because you had all the deposed royalty in the world, everyone was fleeing there, it became the artistic epicenter, you had the birth of abstract expressionism, you had the rise of the American literary scene, you had American cinema, it was, it was New York, right? You had the UN, it became so international. Then the 60s was swinging London, as you may recall, right? So in every decade or so, there's been one city that has been that seminal influence. I think Singapore was that. Um, I think, you know, I wouldn't say entirely because of the hourglass and revolution, but we, we did our part. Um, and and in the, um, I would say from 2004, I mean, with, from the beginning of Tempest, to, I don't know, let's say 2008, 2010. I think that's fair to say, you know? Um, and then the momentum shifted um, a lot to New York.
And I think that um, Ben and Hodinkee rose, uh, and he, they've just celebrated their 10 year anniversary. They, they rose to predominance because they went into the web in a way that was so smart, and the information dissemination was so strong, and the culture that they brought was really strong as well. What they didn't have was a simultaneous um, uh, evolution in terms of the retail scene. Right? But they, from a communication perspective, so what did they end up doing? They ended up doing the retail themselves. Right? But now it's a question of, okay, who's gonna be the next? Right? Um, and I would like to think that we have an opportunity here as well because we have, again, retailers like yourself. We have magazines that are still very much enamored with and still love um, watches and there's so much more interesting things to talk about. And maybe most importantly is because we've gone into e-commerce, it's given us a certain independence from writing only about things, uh, only about brands that advertise with us. <coughs> Which at some some point also will take will deplete the soul out of anything. Will will cause you to become less passionate about something, and and give you the opportunity to go back and write about things that you really want to write about. I mean, there's so many subjects and watches today that haven't still be written about that that could be written about, and 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 uh, and so I'm looking forward now to the next phase, and hopefully we'll be both both be part of that, even though we're now quite a bit older. I don't want to be one of these kind of grumpy old guys that's always like, well, you know, back in the day, this is how it was happening. But if you look at it, we are now in a period where these sort of colossuses of the watch industry are all in their kind of twilight years, the ones that are still with us, right? You know, um, a lot of them have passed. Uh, Nick Hayek has passed. Um, Gunther Blumlein passed prematurely, but even our dear friend Rolf Schneider, um, he passed as well. And who do you have left, basically? You know, Philip Stern is retired. Thierry is brilliant, but, you know, uh, Philip Stern was the guy who basically drove that business to where, where, where it was. Um, you have Jean-Claude Biver, right? And, and as you can see now, he's trying to figure out what he wants to do with the next phase of his life. These were guys that basically built the industry that we experience today. You know, even someone as, like Angelo Bonatti um, and Franco Coloni, I mean, Panerai, people forget the phenomena of what Panerai was, you know? When it, the first 10 years of Panerai were incredible, right? You could buy any Panerai and walk out the store and sell it for 50% more. I mean, you wanna talk about brand equity? That was amazing, right? Um, but all these guys now are in a retirement phase, so who's stepping in to fill those roles? I love the fact that when Jean-Claude Biver, who's not Swiss incidentally, um, he decided that he wanted to get into watchmaking, he spent a year trying to, or not successfully, accessing the souls of the people in the valet, right? He went and played soccer with them, he hung out with watchmakers, he became obsessed with cheese, as, as we clearly know. Um, and he started to infuse that into his life blood, which I think is why he's got such a great affection for product, why he's so good at creating product, and why he loves Patek Philippe so much, because Patek is, quite honestly, the most beautiful watches in the world, right? I don't know if the current CEOs of, uh, of, of the big brands have Patek collections, which they go back to and look at, and they're like, oh my God, look at this 1518, look at this 2499, they just got it so right. How do I get some of this soul and spirit into my watches, right? Um, I feel as if that there is a danger that you're getting people who basically have selected the profession of, of CEO of, of a watch brand because it was one of the viable options that was offered to them, but without the same incredible sensitivity that that these guys had for for watches and for product, you know. And, and, and I hope that there will be exceptions to this. I hope there'll be people who are so in love with watches that, that they go to, go to bed dreaming about watches, as I know you and I do, um, and, and feel like emotionally distraught if we can't get a watch that we want, you know, um, and then feel euphoric when we do have that watch on our wrist, um, which is also something that we need to think about as well, because it also applies to the next generation of watch journalists as well. There, there's a lot of incredibly mediocre journalists in, in this industry because this industry allows people the greatest sort of lifestyle benefits. And this is maybe not something I should be revealing to everyone because now everyone in journalism is going to want to become a watch journalist. But watch journalists are the most spoiled sort of like uh, children in the world. You know, they get flown constantly to beautiful parts of the world, stay in lavish hotels, drink champagne endlessly. Um, and only to communicate about watches. And at the same time, I would say 50% of those guys have no connection whatsoever with watches, don't feel them innately, have no understanding of them, and don't know what the fuck they're talking about, right? So I think that, that it, the onus is upon us, 
right, especially in this period of intense change, that we have to inculcate and breed the next generation of watch journalists, you know, and really get people who are who are true believers, who have great understanding of, of watches, who are in love with this industry in the same way that you and I are. Before you decide to start writing about watches, go and read and learn everything about watches first, right? And maybe you might want to start with a specific field of expertise, let's say Omega Speedmasters, right? So. Um, Go uh, to Omega forums, read Moonwatch only, go and do all of your research. See if it really connects with you in a way that those stories, um, that history, that very real and ex incredible history, and, you know, um, uh, it charms you in some way. And then you're gonna need to go and buy a watch and put it on your wrist and see if it interacts with you in a way that makes you feel really special. And if it does, then you should go into this, and if it doesn't, and I guess this is the same you know, yardstick you could use whether or not you should be the CEO of a watch brand, then maybe go into something else, you know? I was a very late adopter to social media, and I used to get angry at people who were having meals, and then they spent half their time like taking videos of their food or whatever like that. Um, but then, yeah, you know, like again, uh, two and a half, almost three years ago, when we launched um, e-commerce for the rake, someone said, "Listen, you're going to have to get onto social media because they people need to have an understanding of the person who created this magazine, the type of life he leads, because that's all part of of creating an identity." Um, what I I, I I didn't realize is as clearly I must be incredibly egotistical because I I actually quite enjoyed it. Um, initially, it was hard to kind of find your ground, and, and I think that what people dig about my social media is that it's kind of no holds bar. You know, it's whether I, and it's funny because people I, were telling me their favorite um, stories from me are the ones where I've been, my plane, my flight's been canceled, or my luggage's gone missing, and I'm just losing my shit in an airport, you know? Um, but it's, it's, I guess it's relatable because it's human, you know? Um, I think that that's important also that even though we live in a world where we, we, we're dealing with incredibly beautiful objects, um, um, very rarefied objects. I think you can't lose your touch as being kind of a normal person as well. And to see people going through ups and emotional ups and downs, regardless of what they're doing in life and, and how cool people may perceive their life to be, I think is refreshing to people, right? Like my happiest moment is actually being kind of sitting on the couch by myself or maybe with my dog, um, you know, caressing my watches as if I'm Gollum, you know, uh, in Lord of the Rings, um, or kind of observing them or having a glass of wine or just thinking about what I want to do or reading a novel or watching a Netflix series. Yeah, there's a certain um, face that I guess you create for social media. Like I'm not all the time riding on a buggy in a plane, eating caviar and, and drinking champagne. That's only like 75% of the time. <laughs>